Thank you for holding. Parties will be on a listen-only mode until the question and answer session of today's conference. At that time, you can press star 1 to ask a question. This conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect. I'd like to introduce your first speaker, Mr. Peter Silva. Uh, thank you. And thank you to everyone uh, joining on the call. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you may be viewing from. We, uh, I have uh, also with me, I'm a, the technical marketing manager covering security for F5 Networks. I also have Jonathan George, who's our product marketing manager, uh, who covers security here with F5. And actually, we're over here at, um, we're in Vegas at Interop, so we took a little time out from the show to share a little bit about protecting against the latest uh, attacks out there with the F5 Big IP, so we do appreciate everyone on the call. So let's get right into it. We have about maybe half hour of content, certainly not going to take up the full hour today going over stuff. We always like to um, give a little bit and then uh, let it let it open up for questions and answers. We find a lot of times that that's when most of the learning and exchange of ideas and such happen uh, during that QA process. So, so the threats are evolving. Um, this slide right here is from the 2011 Verizon Data Breach Investigations Report. And the thing about these threats that are evolving, what we've seen over the last six to eight months is that these are no longer sort of single-layer attacks. You know, in, in, the, in the days of yore, it was either primarily a network-based attack, like a DOS attack and, and those sorts of things. And then in other instances, you see things like Layer 7 attacks, so you know, forceful browsing, SQL injections, and so forth. And, and up until about six to eight months ago, those were exclusive of each other. It was typically one or the other. What we're starting to see now recently is multi-layered attacks, is these attacks that potentially start at the network layer, start with a denial of service attack, and then gradually as the denial of service starts inching its way in, a second attack then comes along, and it's usually uh, along layer seven, an application layer attack. And, and there are certainly technologies out there that can protect against one or the other, but if you're getting hit on, on two different sides, on two different layers, oftentimes that's what will uh, infiltrate the system. That's what will cause the breach. The top two um, uh, categories here by percentage of breach, you can see one is malware and the other is hacking. And this is sort of interesting. You know, hacking is typically riffraff out there doing his own thing, trying to penetrate a system. And so, you know, it's an individual just trying to trying to gain access and steal information. And malware, on the other hand, however, oftentimes the hacker needs some help, needs some help from a user. And so malware gets in when users click on malicious links in emails, when users open uh, virus-infected Excel spreadsheets. Like, that's what happened in the uh, most recent RSA breach, is that somebody sent out an email with, a, with an infected Excel file uh, with some upcoming information, you got to check it out, click here, you know, all of the urgency required. And, and it only takes one. In, in the RSA instance, the majority of those emails all went into the junk folder of pretty much everybody within the email system, but it enticed just one person. That person pulled it out of the junk folder, opened up the email file, opened up the Excel spreadsheet, and there you have it. And so it's sort of interesting that, you know, the two top ones, and, and they're almost side by side, that, you know, some of these, some of these uh, malicious hackers, they just try to, you know, do it solo, do it on their own, try to get it on their own. But then also there's a, there's a huge contingency out there that like to get help from the inside. And so, so while the threats are evolving, even and, and because these are multi-layered threats, our own behaviors, what we do as just human beings, also needs to adjust, adapt, and, and make sure that everyone continues to be educated along the way as to these new emerging threats. Kind of nice to see social going down. Um, social engineering used to be. And so here's sort of the trend over time. You can see the malware and hacking, um, you know, continuing to grow and stay higher pace, where many of the others 
are starting to drop off. You know, maybe the, you know, social networking is starting to drop off because people are aware of the fact that, well, gee, you know, I shouldn't be telling everybody on my Facebook page that I'm traveling to grandmother's house over the river and through the woods because I'm basically telling all the crooks out there, hey, you know, my home is available for burglary. So maybe it's something along those lines because of all those social media threats and, and uh, media reports of social media hacking. Maybe that's, you know, helping those people who might not be that aware of, of um, the threats out there not to put that type of information out there. The top vulnerability classes. And so, and so there's also a number of vulnerabilities that are out there. And I believe this is from, this is from the White Hat, right? Yeah. So this is from White Hat Security, one of our top partners here at F5. And you can see here, cross-site scripting and information leakage uh, seem to be the top two there. And so cross-site scripting is things like um, injecting a script into a form or other sort of places in the, web, in the website, which then when a user comes along, actually either redirects to a user, redirects the user to another site, or has the user do some sort of action that then helps the hacker uh, hacker come along. And so, you know, it's scripts that then affect across the site. And, of course, information leakage is just um, people either stealing information or more or less it's unauthorized users gaining access to information that they are not authorized to see. Uh, retail, and retail also includes places like hospitality, uh, seem to be the top targets. Well, IT, of course, you know, businesses and intellectual property. Corporate espionage seems to have um, become a nice target for for the hackers these days. But a lot of times it's, you know, re retail and hospitality. The thing that has changed, however, is a couple of years ago, it was things like the Heartland payment systems, you know, Target, TJ Maxx, these these huge retail companies where the hacker wants to go in for the big score. If I just get this one, then I can retire on the beach somewhere. Now, what's happening more recently, we haven't seen these big, massive breaches of late. In fact, the number of uh, compromised records overall has gone down. It has gone down tremendously of the number of compromised records. But the problem is that the number of incidences, the number of incidents that the Secret Service investigates, the number of incidences that, you know, Verizon investigates, those have gone up. And the reason is because these big, massive Heartland breaches are not occurring. What these hackers are doing, the hackers are kind of doing what, you know, a lot of security professionals do. They're doing risk mitigation and risk management. You know, what's the risk of breaking into Heartland and trying to steal you know, 10 million or whatever credit cards versus the risk of trying to break into a, you know, a little bitty hotel or a mom and pop dry cleaner or the Chinese restaurant down the street. So what's happening is they're starting, they're just trying to hit all of these low level or um, uh, may, they might think it's easier to be penetrated uh, type of type of businesses and industries and even potentially, you know, some of the, the convictions that have come down over the last couple of years. Maybe they're kind of scared of that and so, oh, I'm not going to go after the big score. I'm going to start, you know, just chipping away at all these little things. And so and so the big ones are going down, but all these little ones continue to go up. But these would be the obviously the breakout by industry of who's getting hit the most. It takes a while. So once once you find that you have a vulnerability, this is also from White Hat Security. So you say you have a vulnerability, you find a vulnerability on the website, maybe it's in the code, maybe it's just some other mechanism that's going on. It takes time to fix it. You can see here, like, information leakage, almost three months. Cross-site scripting, a couple of months. I mean, insufficient authentication, that's a third of a year, you know, four to five months to fix that. And that's after you find it. You know, once you find it, then all the bells and whistles go off, everybody gathers up for a meeting, oh, we got to do this right away. But it takes time. And during that time, the website, the organization, the company, the confidential information, the users, the executives, to some extent, due to regulations and compliance, they're all vulnerable. They all continue to be vulnerable while these, while these um, vulnerabilities, you know, are out there. 
So it can be a big challenge for IT when, when these, these, um, these things come along. And as we kind of started, um, kind of started out earlier when I was talking, you know, they start with these d distributed denial of service attacks. And essentially, a denial of service attack is, you know, more or less exactly what it says is some sort of method. And oftentimes, it is a flood of traffic. It is just a massive amount of traffic that the routers, the switches, the, the web servers themselves are just unable to handle. It's an overload of traffic. And then just the website is, is nobody can get to it. So valid users can't get to the website. And so that's essentially, you know, what's occurring is once those valid users or once the website is unavailable uh, via a network-based attack, they then start, you know, getting in, breaking in through Layer 7. And this is what we've seen a lot of, of the, many of the most recent attacks is they, they start with these distributed denial of service attacks. You know, we've maybe, maybe we've all have heard of those bots out there. Um, due to malware, it's kind of all intertwined, right? It's a huge cyber crime web that goes on. You need you need to get these you know computers infected out there with malware, and once they're infected with malware, then they can be rented out as botnets. And when you can rent it out as a botnet, then hackers can use that to do distributed or just plain old straight on uh, denial of service attacks. And of course, you know, number the number of the sites that have been affected by that recently. As we talked about, they're the first of many multi-layer attacks. You know, uh, a lot of just attacks in warfare. You go after a particular location, maybe divert the attention of your enemy or whoever you're trying to infiltrate. Once their attention is diverted to a different location, you may, you know, swing about, swing around the back, the back door to get in, and they're all caught by surprise. A lot of times the network firewalls can't protect against these attacks because the because not only is the traffic so great, so the so the the firewalls themselves might not have the horsepower, the CPU, the throughput capabilities to handle the massive amount of, of um traffic coming through, but they're also layer three firewalls. The network based firewalls and those firewalls certainly don't have visibility into the application layer, the layer seven attacks, the attacks that are coming through the browser. And so they, they certainly will not protect against things like SQL injections, for instance. And so I'm going to turn it over to Jonathan for the next couple of slides to talk a little bit about uh, the HP Gary uh, hack or breach that went that uh, recently occurred. And it's sort of interesting because it's a mixture, as we were talking earlier, a little bit of mixture of um, uh, uh, technology issues but also uh, plenty of human issues that occurred during the HP Gary attack. So here you go, Jonathan. Thanks, Peter. Uh, my name is Jonathan George. I'm going to walk you through the anatomy of an attack. HP Gary is a, uh, a computer forensic analysis um, vendor. Um, they do services as well as uh, you know trying to find out for their customers. Um, computer forensics and malware analysis tools that they provide in order to detect and isolate, you know, worms and viruses and trojans, and they have some other services as well on the side. Um, this is a very public attack if you didn't know about it. Um, they basically um, have a very good service to many different companies. One of the issues, though, was their leader um, befriended uh, the anonymous group, and so as we've seen before, the anonymous group um, attacked those uh, vendors that said they, that they wouldn't do business anymore with the WikiLeaks um, attacks, and so uh, our WikiLeaks group, and of course um, they went and attacked those vendors. Well, HB Gary had gone and befriended the anonymous group through forums and that sort of thing, befriended the, the leaders. Well, then um, he came out and publicly. Um, Said that he was going to let them, let the public know who these anonymous leaders were, and actually then went and told anonymous this. So uh, you know, unfortunately for him and uh, HP Gary, they uh, anonymous went and had a swift response um, to HP Gary. <clears throat> Basically, first they went with a SQL injection attack against HP Gary. This is anonymous and basically um, were able to drop uh, the SQL database table 
uh, find out what the passwords were, uh, or at least the password hash. And this is not public, but you know you could easily use something like a rainbow table to find out what the passwords were, or the theoretically what they were. Try those passwords out. Long story short, they were able to find out what the passwords were. Uh, they were using Google Apps, H.B. Uh, Gary was, and find out what those passwords were. Found out that the leader uh, or the, the 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 president actually was not just the not just um, a, a member of Google Apps and had a username signed on, but he was he was uh, listed as an administrator. So one thing you know is an example of what not to do. He was listed as an administrator. Well, through that they were able to gain access to all um, members of HP Gary, their passwords. Found out that the, uh, um, the, the I think it was the CFO um, tried to use his password on various different sites. Found out that his password was reused, same password was reused for email, as well as the whole support site for HP Gary. Um, then con to continue on, uh, they also um, found out that the uh, HB Gary had, the owner of HB Gary had a relation, relational site, and this relational site was kind of a rootkit site, um, .com site that was basically a research site. Through that, they impersonated him and uh, had a conversation over email with one of the members uh, of that research site and gained um, access to um, uh, that site as well. So long story short is basically they went ahead and completely defaced their sites. Um, of course, uh, this is one of their uh, um, logos, completely defaced their site and basically, they then, you know, of course, showed um, that they truly had control of the site. Um, they did this through uh, initially a SQL injection uh, because the web application had SQL injection flaws, uh, insecure passwords. They did social engineering um, by finding out passwords um, from, from another user um, and, and, you know, the IP address and being able to change that site. Passwords, of course, were badly chosen. They were being reused. Servers um, that were designed with to allow password-based authentication uh, and a willingness to hand out credentials over email. Long story short, this is an example of a multi-layer attack that is really normal these days. It's very easy to uh, impersonate individuals, have uh, different types of attacks, and we see this more and more. And it's not just, as Peter was saying, for instance, they're trying to gain as much money as possible from the information and data that they're stealing. Sometimes it's just social reasons that they feel like they want to go against a, a company because somebody has threatened them. So long story short, I, I'm, I hand it back to Peter. Um, this is just a great example of an anatomy of attack. That's multi-layer. Hey, thanks, Jonathan. So one of the things we find here is that no matter how strong the technology, you can have the systems locked down. You can have the best web security, the best system security, the best application security out there. You can have it properly configured. You can have the strongest policy. You can have all that in place. But as long as, you know, the human behavior, as long as people are using password one as their password and it's being uh, the passwords, the same password is being used across the sites. The best technology can't defend against that. As long as people are opening up their mouths and revealing information, the best technology cannot protect against that. And so it's really got to be not only the technology in place, but also our behavior of, of maybe question, you know, questioning a little more. It was, I just found it very interesting. Um, back when this was first reported, that it was one of the IT admins sending email back and forth and actually bought that it was the guy who said he was. He didn't think to pick up the phone, um, didn't think to maybe validate it at some point. You know, one of the things I do, you know, you, you, um, we often, you know, the, you call the bank or you call the doctor and they ask you for a particular piece of information. Oh, what's your, your mother's maiden name, your dog's name, whatever else. One of the things I do, it's kind of funny, you know, if the, if the doctors or the insurance you know, say the insurance company calls, oh, we have a question about the medication or the prescription you ordered, and, and you, can you tell us a little bit of information about yourself to validate you are who you say you are? I actually turn it back to them. Why don't you tell me who my doctor is? You can put up any phone number on the caller ID. You can call and say, 
Who, you know, I'm, I'm the president for crying out loud. Well, why don't you give me a piece of information to, uh, so I can ensure you are who you say you are. And so this obviously, um, can have bad PR and, and get, you know, passed around social media, um, pretty extensively as we've seen. And so how do we protect against some of this sort of stuff out there? You might not think, but the big IP local traffic manager, which is our primary application delivery controller, and a lot of people think about it as, oh, it's load balancing. Out of the box, the big IP LTM does provide a number of network layer security features, like the denial of service protection, like SIN flood and UDP um, protection. And that's how a lot of that denial of service attacks are are. Are, are start with, and it starts with SIN floods. That's a type of denial of service attack. You can lock down ports. A lot of, uh, for instance, during the HP Geary, um, as the as the email exchange was going back and forth, one of the email, one of the exchanges said, the IT guy says, "Oh, did you um, did you open a, a non well known port, or did you happen to open port something something something? I can't remember the exact port name." And what the guy did is he he gained access to one port, and once he gained access to the system via the IT guy, he started opening these other ports up to then get a back-end system. These are non-well-known ports, not not like port 80, port 443, but the higher-end ports. And so um, you can do port lockdown. So even if somebody is going after a non-well-known port or trying to open it like they did in the HP Gary, the LTM will protect against it. SSL termination, packet filtering, um, uh, ACL. So there's a number of of security measures that are built into the uh, to the LTM that protects you right away from those network-based attacks. Now, as I mentioned, you know, a network-based firewall won't protect against layer 7 attacks, and so you need a web application firewall to protect against the web application attacks, and that's the big IP application security manager providing that web app, that web layer, the layer 7 protection for your applications and these are the type of attacks that often come through the browser. The brute force attacks, the denial of service attacks, the SQL injection attacks, the cross-site scripting attacks. That's what the big IT ASM uh, will protect against. It can also help you meet PCI compliance. We have a screenshot a little bit later in the presentation that shows, you know, how you can, how big IT ASM will let you know if you are within compliance of specifically the 6.6 .6 standard of of PCI. And and the other sort of thing to take away from this slide is one of the things we talk about the big IP or all of our big IP platforms is they sit in that strategic point of control within the data center. If you think about the flow of anything, electricity, water, commerce, people, traffic, there are always these strategic points of control within that flow that provide security that provide redistribution. You know, think of a stop sign on a two-lane road, a power grid in a high-rise building. And the same with data, the same with traffic going back and forth between users and the resources there. So the users, you know, we're all mobile. We're in, we're in Vegas. I'm usually working out of Southern California, so I'm mobile. The, the, the resources and the applications themselves are now becoming more mobile. They're not static in a single data center anymore. They may be floating to the cloud for bursting. They may be floating to the cloud for disaster recovery. There may be a, you know, a, a smaller installation of exchange at a branch office. So even the applications are moving around. And so sitting within that strategic point of control, taking the context of the user, who they are, their device, uh, what type of network they're coming from, and all of these varying pieces of information, this varying metadata, taking that information and then making the intelligent decision to then where to direct this, the, that specific user. And it, it, the, the other sort of thing is um, because we're, we sit in that strategic point of control within the data center, we have visibility into the applications. So we know what those applications are doing. We know how available they are. We know, if, uh, you know, other varying things. We talked a little bit about context. And then being able to take action and mitigate against such attacks. That's what, you know, when I talk about security, that's what security really is. And we face it, we deal with it on a daily basis. Security is really about risk mitigation, risk management. You know, risk is really the, the potential of something bad, you know, or the potential that, 
that something bad will happen. That's all risk, kind of the definition of risk. And we do it every day. You know, the potential of us getting into a car accident on the way to work, that's a risk we take. But the, the benefits outweigh that risk. we got to go to work to, you know, provide for our family and pay our bills and do the things we like to do. And so it's all about this risk mitigation and risk management. There may be some risks that are too great to take. And this is what companies got to do on a, on a daily basis. So there may be an attack that happens once a month, but they're not going after my financial data. They're not really hurting anybody. They're not getting us into compliance trouble. You know what? That's a risk I'm going to take. I'm not going to really deal with it. We'll deal with it with another time or we'll mitigate it some other way. But there might be this other risk, this other threat that only happens once a year. And this once a year thing, they go after our financials. They try to hit us hard. And so that one I'm going to pay attention to, and I'm going to try to do everything within my power to mitigate that risk. Oh, I hit the wrong button there. And so Big IP Application Security Manager can help you mitigate those, those types of risks and probably make the risk level a lot less great because it will protect against the OWASP top 10 and all of these the ones, all of those, you know, nasty grams and variables and, and vulnerabilities that we were showing early on in the presentation. It also enables Layer 2 through Layer 7 protection, so not just the network-based, but also the application-based, and does all of the logging, reporting, pretty graphs, and everything else that's needed for compliance and, and really understanding not only your applications, but what, what a, what are the types of things that the bad guys out there are trying to access? What are the bad guys trying to gain into to help you better understand where your, your greater risks are to then mitigate those sorts of risks? Oh, and then, of course, we're the um, FC Magazine Reader's Choice winner for two years in a row. I talked a little bit about the OWASP Top Ten uh, a uh, great partner of ours, White Hat Security, their CEO is um, Jeremiah Grossman. He's pretty involved in this OWASP Top Ten. And I think it's every year or every other year they go through and look at, um, you know, what are the greatest vulnerabilities out there? And really, what are the areas that companies should probably focus on initially? What are the primary risks that will allow, you know, because, you know, security, because it's risk mitigation and risk management, there might be only so much budget to go around. There might be only so much staff to go around to handle these these security threats. And oftentimes, I mean, with the H.B. Gary and, and many of these others, boy, you know, those those criminals out there are sometimes, you know, better trained, better funded, and more knowledgeable than many of the people that are employed to try to protect against those risks. And so in some ways, the OWASP Top Ten is, is created to help companies understand what are the greatest threats out there and what are the areas that I should probably focus on initially in terms of protecting my systems and protecting my application. And it's adaptive. And so, um, you know, there's, there's this idea of the negative security model and the positive security model. And the negative security model oftentimes are these network firewalls or these signature-based firewalls. And signature, all signatures are, are those, um, are the, the blockers or the protection against all the well-known, and not even well-known, all the known threats that are out there. And so here's this huge list of all the bad things that can happen. Okay, let's build a signature list. Okay, this is how we stop all them bad things from happening. And you import that list and now you got, you're protected against all the, all the known stuff out there. But we've also seen, you know, almost on a, on a monthly basis that there are these zero-day attacks. There are, there are these vulnerabilities that, you know, a 14-year-old in Finland finds at 1 o'clock in the morning, <coughs> excuse me, that nobody else knows about. And the signatures will not protect against that. And so the positive security model, which is, which is the ASM kind of uh, blends both the negative security, it does have the signature set, so it's easy for administrators to protect against all the well-known, all the known stuff out there. But it's also a positive security model. And the positive security model is somewhere along the lines of you create a policy that says this is what you, this is the only thing you are allowed to do. So you must check this particular box. You must 
fill out this specific form before you can click, you know, the link for next or continue or get to the next page. You're walking down the hallway. You got to walk down the hallway, take 10 steps. You got to take out the, the spearmint gum from your mouth, you know, put it on the wall, turn around three times, knock on the door twice, you get in. But if you're coming down the hallway, you do everything the same except you put bubble gum on the wall and then knock on the door twice, you won't get in. The negative security model might allow you in where the positive security model will not. And it's out of the box. So a lot of these this uh, protection, particularly against the OWASP, is essentially turning the unit on. Uh, there's a lot of pre-built templates. So we work with various vendors, Microsoft, Oracle, SAP. And over the years, we've developed these deployment guides or best practices guides that help our customers um, put together policies to protect against Exchange, for instance, to protect against SharePoint, SAP, et cetera. We've turned those into templates. And so you might be setting up Big IP ASM for your Exchange environment, and you might not have to necessarily know Exchange. Exchange can use, you know, a number of different ports to open and close various things. But all you need to do is just click a little radio dial. Oh, I want to I wanna protect against Exchange. You click the button hit next, and then many of the fields are already pre-populated for you to make sure with the optimal results and the right protection and, and only the specific ports being opened and, and only being opened, to, you know, in a certain either inbound or outbound depending upon the particular uh, criticalness or need of that port to make Exchange work. And it's as simple as just clicking a few, choosing an application, clicking through a few buttons, and immediately Exchange is is protected. If you go back, if we go back and look at those, the number of days to protect the vulnerabilities, heck, I don't want my system exposed for another three months. What are we going to do? Well, you can throw in the big IP application security manager. They throw in like it's, you know, a baseball or something. You can install the big IP application security manager and it'll immediately protect against those vulnerabilities that you may find and not leave you exposed for three to four months while you're then trying to fix those vulnerabilities. And so it allows the companies to immediately get protection so that they can then go back and fix and take care of whatever the vulnerability is, not stay exposed for that amount of time, because that can just, you know, continue to lead to greater and, and more threats down the line. Oh, the PCI, I kind of talked a little bit about um, the PCI. You know, with PCI, there's in... Um, Within the 6.6 .6 requirement, you can either have a web application firewall or a web application scanner, a, vun a vulnerability scanner. And so you're kind of in a catch-22 in that point. Well, okay, I have, I have a scanner. It's found all these vulnerabilities, and now I've got to go back and fix it. I don't have a, a web application firewall to protect. And then on the converse side, oh, great, I have a web application firewall. I have, you know, this policy in place, but I'm really not sure – you know, what What other exposures there are out there? What other vulnerabilities are within my application? We have a, we have a nice relationship with White Hat Security where there, we, it's integrated, the ASM is integrated with the Sentinel scanner. And so the Sentinel scanner will scan the application, find all the vulnerabilities, and it's literally a button. I'm not kidding you. It finds all the vulnerabilities, you get this nice report, and you click this button, and the Sentinel will then send that information over to the Big IP ASM and instantly build a policy based on what the scanner has found. And so you get the best of both worlds when it comes to PCI compliance. Let's go to the next one. Big IP ASM also gives you just a lot of information. One of the things about security, and particularly that OWASP Top 10 and the different sorts of attacks, is really understanding what it means. And so we've, we've built in a lot of the descriptions and information and, and knowledge for administrators and for users to really understand what those different attacks and vulnerabilities are all about. And specific to PCI compliance, we even give you a list of the 12 requirements for 6.6 .6, uh, compliance, and we'll let you know if you're in compliance or not. And so, for instance, you can see um, number three, protect stored cardholder data. Now, that's checked. If, it, if, if, it, if there was a red X or not in compliance, 
what ASM will do is you can then click on View Details. When you click on View Details and the, and the compliance date is not in the green check, you're not good, in the View Details, it'll tell you exactly, oh, go to this place, you know, because this applies to sensitive information and sensitive information leakage, go to this place within the Big IP ASM and check the box that says Mask Data. And as soon as you do that, you check the box for mass data, you come back to this place, the, the check mark turns green. And so it even helps you along the way, not only to understand the vulnerabilities, not only to understand the threats, but also within the unit itself, how to then, you know, create a policy or, or just configure the big IP ASM to protect against that. And so mass data only, you know, and protecting cardholder data, that essentially puts asterisks or other different characters in place of credit card numbers or social security numbers and those sorts of things. So even if, for whatever reason, uh, somebody might gain access through different different means, that data on the way out, it, you know, it, it'll be garbled data or encrypted data or unusable data on the way out because all that sensitive information has been masked. Oh, yeah, and here's just a close-up view. And so this is how the flow works, right? You know, user says, I want to go www.somewhere.com. The policy is checked on the way in. Are you allowed to do this? Does it match all the signatures? Are you trying to do anything nasty to us? Okay, you can go in. It then get, gets it to the server. The server responds. Maybe the server is, might be vulnerable. Maybe there will be some code problems in there, whatever the case may be. But it also then, as you just mentioned, with the, with the mass data piece, the information goes back out through the ASM, and then the policy is checked again. It's enforced again on the way out. So it's not only protecting your systems from malicious users trying to gain access, it's also then protecting that information on the way out so that to ensure that sensitive information is not then leaked out uh, inappropriately. So both, you know, application protocol and network layer protection. Thought I hit the next one. There we go. A uh, nice, um, a nice uh, testimonial from one of our customers. Saving money, saving time, easy protection, more security. And we can also integrate products. I'm not going to, I'm certainly not going to go into, um, you know, features and benefits of Access Policy Manager or Web Accelerator. But within the big IP framework, within the, our, our TMOS, the traffic management operating system, you can also layer services. So right on local traffic manager, you can also add the application security manager. It's available as a standalone or as a module on LTM. You can also uh, add things like Access Policy Manager, which is an identity and access management solution for Big IP LTM, or even Web Accelerator on there, accelerate and optimize web application traffic on the way out. You can even see, you know, the Oracle Database Firewall. We even have a nice uh, reporting integration with the Oracle Database Firewall where if the, they work in conjunction you know, specific to SQL injections. Now, one of the problems that uh, database firewalls have is because of where they sit, they really don't are, not, are unable to gather the context about the user. Everything looks like it comes from a trusted user because it's coming from the web tier. You can see that right there in the topology. Oh, the web tier, those are trusted users. Come on in. But if it's a SQL injection, that's not a good thing. <laughs> if I block the SQL injection, it might stop it right there. But it also doesn't gain all the insight as to the user and other metadata and all that contextual information you may need to prosecute that individual, to find out where they were coming from. And so the nice integration between the application security manager and the Oracle database firewall is the fact that with that integration, the big IP application security manager can now uh, um, integrate and, and provide that contextual information to go along with that SQL injection that the database firewall may have encountered. And now you got much richer data to then be able to act upon. It's much, much more deeper information to make those risk management decisions, to then tighten down the policy against specific locations, specific users, so on and so forth. So there's various uh, integrations with a number of partners 
uh, throughout the F5 security ecosystem. And I think this is where we're getting close to the end. So leading protection from the latest attacks, both known and even, you know, zero-day attacks with the positive security model, helping meet PCI compliance. If I remember correctly, on the Verizon report, that a significant number, somewhere in the 70 percentile range, if I remember correctly, of those people that were breached were also not PCI compliant. It's kind of, you know, you'd, you'd think these days, oh, everybody's heard of it, and I'm putting my credit card all over the Internet. You, you, you cross your fingers and just hope that there's compliance. But there's still a significant amount of uh, companies out there that are not compliant. You know, one of the most recent clients, you might have noticed that, you, you know, pretty much all the gas stations where you live and all the gas stations across the country are all going through this. Uh, they're all getting new pumps because the deadline for PCI compliance for the unattended point-of-sale devices was actually last July, I believe. And so now you're seeing this this massive change of all these gas stations around the country going to these more secure pumps because those all needed to be in compliance last year. And then easily and quickly resolving those application vulnerabilities that you may find along the way because it takes it may take potentially take a lot of time to fix those things, but you need protection immediately as to not stay exposed. And with that, uh, I'm actually going to put it on um, speaker. We we were uh, we didn't have it on speaker due to the echo in the in the in the hotel room, but I'm going to put it on speaker now and open it up for any questions if you guys have anything. If you'd like to ask a question from the phones, press star 1. Please unmute your phone and record your name. To withdraw your question, press star 2. Once again, it's star 1 to ask a question, and you do need to record your name. Please stand by for the first question. I'm not showing any questions from the phones at this time. Peter, we do have a couple questions online, so if you guys could click there and take a look at the Q&A tab. Yeah, we actually just did that. Thanks, Cecile. Vice for a fragmented attack on the LTM. Um, I'm actually, let me, um, I'm actually there, I'm going to make a note of this. Uh, I'm unaware of any exposure to this. The, uh, so the question, just for everybody on the phone, is what about F5's exposure to the ICMP fragmented packets attack on the LTM? Were you aware of that? Okay, you know what? Um, let me look into that. We might have a solution already or a, um, or a fix on that. Let me see. Let me see. MP. I'm just going to... Uh, Hey, hey, Cecile, are we able to? Um, do I need to write these questions down in case I, in case we don't know, or will we get a report of this after? Oh, we'll get a report of it after. Oh, okay. Thank you. Semi-trans. Do you know what version semi-transparent mode is available? It's at least a little bit. This is Jonathan. It's at least available in our 10.0 10 platform or 10.x platform. You can put it in. Um, um, both blocking, semi-transparent, and uh, transparent mode. So V10. Yeah, at least V10. Okay. So the question was, please explain semi-transparent mode, and in what version is this mode available? As Jonathan mentioned, it would be starting in version 10. Uh, so is the DDoS, the next question is, uh, is the DDoS protection comes built in with an LTM, or I have to add the module on ASM. So there are two, there's sort of two pieces to this. The, the network-based denial of service attack, so the layer three stuff is built into local traffic manager, the uh, simple configuration setting. If you're looking for the layer seven denial of service attacks, then that would require the ASM uh, module. So it really depends on which layer of denial of service that um, that you're looking to protect against. The network stuff is already built into ASM. Um, if you're looking to have the layer seven DOS protection, and that, that's another easy setup, just clicking a few boxes and setting some parameters uh, that you would need the ASM one for the layer seven denial of service. 
The next question is, uh, M86 has a secure web gateway which protects from malware. Does F5 have a similar product? Well, we have our um, message security module is one, but also on the uh, application security manager, it does uh, protect against uh, malicious uploads. So it will check the, any files that are, that can, you know, a lot of times you talk about downloading files, malicious files from the servers, but in forums and such, you know, certainly users can upload malicious files to sites and forums and, and other places where file upload is allowed. And, uh, the big IP ASM does protect against the, uh, with a virus scanner against, um, infected files being uploaded to a system. Yeah, so this is Jonathan. We do support ICAP, and so with those uploaded files, we can send them to an antivirus server for scanning before we allow them to be uploaded. Also, as uh, one other note, uh, as Ma Peter mentioned, we do have the uh, message security um, module, uh, <clears throat> which is an add-on module to LTM as well, um, securing um, those, uh, the traffic like exchange traffic, for instance, from a lot of spam, and so instead of going all the way to the web server, we can protect it at uh, Big IP. Nobody wants to speak up, but they love sending these uh, Q&As, which is cool. So is there a roadmap for database fire functionality inside ASM, if any, other than SQL injection signature protections? Uh, I get it. So let me I'll just flat out say um, that I'm, I'm not the product manager for ASM, so I really don't, uh, can't really speak to things like uh, roadmap right now, but I'm sure if you call your local rep that they could certainly, you know, come in and, and obviously under NDA probably sit down and discuss with you any roadmap items for any of our products that you may be interested in. But I, I really can't uh, just, you know, please understand, I really can't comment on any, you know, futures or roadmap items on a, on a webinar such as this. We do have, you know, um, some new versions, you know, coming shortly, but uh, as far as what's, what's contained in them, I really can't say. And for, like, database security, we do have an integration with uh, Oracle Database Firewall where we can protect against any type of uh, database security. So as Peter had already talked about, we can protect with the network layer, uh, with LTM, with ASM, we can protect against the application layer. With integrations uh, to folks like Oracle, we can protect against the database layer. And uh, another question is, we send out this presentation. Oh, I missed the first few slides. Um, I can't, we talked about this actually at the top of the call, didn't we? Yeah. Uh, we'll make the, pre the recorded presentation available. That will include the slides, though. It won't just be our audio talking, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah, we will, we'll make the slides and the audio Available, yeah. not just, you know, our, our... It'll be the recorded presentation. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions, either via audio or um, on the chat? You can go to the Q&A chat and actually um, input a, a question if you would like. Again, it's star one, and please record your name to ask a question from the phone. Well, all right then. Um, thanks again, everyone. Actually, a question did just queue up on the phone. Okay. Did you want to take that? It's Janice Nathel. No, I, I just wanted to tell you that it was a great presentation and the information was, uh, um, you know, it was needed and necessary. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. And it got me out of booth duty down at the interrupt show floor, <laughs> so it couldn't be any better. <laughs> Uh, let's see, we think we got one more here. Do you have a recommendation for managing policies between multiple modules in ASM? This is Jonathan, I'll take that one. So you can design a policy on one device uh, or on, on a you know, module on a device. And by the way, ASM comes as a module on LTM or as a standalone offering, either way, however you want to set up your, your network. So. Uh, you can design a policy on a device. You can then export that policy to other devices. Um, 
we can easily, easily do that now. Um, it'll be easier uh, going forward as well in, in future versions. Just know that once you design a policy on one device, then you can um, be able to send it to other devices. Thanks, John. Let's see, we got one more, another question. If I have two LTM in active standby mode, do I have to buy two, S two ASM modules or just one? You know that better than I. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, it is recommended that you actually have, uh, if you have active uh, standby, um, that you have uh, ASM on one LTM and ASM on another. Uh, it's best practices best practice to have ASM on both, um, and yet um, you'll, you'll need to purchase on both. However, I would t uh, for you locally, if you decide that, that you do want to implement ASM on both devices, talk to your salesperson and um, um, you know, walk them through what you're trying to do and then and see what the opportunities are. There are no questions from the phones at this time. Yeah, we got, uh, let's see, another one. The best way to get a, get at violation forensics data remotely, not through the GUI. I control and I rule, or how do we? Um... I, are, I'm asking a question to a question. It, it sounds like uh, you're trying to access that violation forensic data remotely. Um, not through you the can GUI. you can certainly set up triggers, you know, so you, yeah. you might not you might not have to log in through the GUI, but every time or any time there's and you might not do it on on all alerts or triggers, maybe only the critical ones to just have them, uh, you know, ship to syslog or emailed to you, and then and then you'd be able to at least be be aware of what's going on. And I believe the the email does have the you know a link to then um, see more detailed information. And uh, with, like, say, for instance, PCI compliance is a great example. We, you can share the, um, that report externally, like, say, with an auditor. For instance, an auditor will come in, do a PCI compliance review on the device. So the PCI compliance reporting we have is just for the device. So the auditor comes in, reviews it, and again, we don't, we don't say you're PCI compliant. Uh, we just say we uh, comply with the requirements. The auditor is the one that says you're PCI compliant. However, he, he or she may come in and say, you know what, you're compliant with you know, these three requirements, but these two, I, I think you need to make some changes, and here's a couple changes. The next time they review that report, they don't have to be on site to actually review that. You can send them the information remotely so that you can access um, that report uh, of, of wherever they're located versus having to come in, view the GUI, that sort of thing. Pay the hourly consulting fee. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else, folks? There are no questions from the phones. And we have none here on the on the live meeting Q and A. So once again, thank you so much. Uh, this actually was a pretty fun presentation. So um, have a great day. And if you have any more questions or need anything, you can certainly visit us at www.f5.com. You can follow us on Twitter, and that's uh, at F5 networks and and or you know contact your local sales rep. Thanks again. Have a great day everyone. That concludes today's conference. You may disconnect at this time.